Chapter 13. Country she had never seen before flowed past the bus window. Beautiful country, even the alternating grassland and thinned forest of the half-claimed hinterland north of the city. The manicured lawns around the looping, knotted interchanges. A pair of crane-topped towers rising like columns of black rock through the vast distance of the late summer haze. Then the thickening forest as the doubled highway merged into a single strip of road. She had never learned to drive, and anyway, she had never had occasion to travel northward for shows or anything else, having been hurled directly from the Toronto club scene to international fame. Despite this, the North had been a real presence in her life for 25 years because it was where Dylan had gone, to the Kapkigawan Maximum Security Correctional Facility in the little town of Kapkigawan, 600 kilometers north of Toronto. Originally a settlement of loggers and miners, Kapkigawan had existed before the prison, but now it existed for the prison alone. Its 800 residents either worked in it or worked for those who worked in it. Most people in central Canada had heard of it, the name being mentioned in every media story on the region's most notorious murderers and rapists, but few could have even pointed it out on a map. Now, as she sped towards it in a bus that was emptier with every stop, the new beauty of the countryside and its incredibly quiet and deserted little towns, the first new beauty she had encountered since her first international tours, filled her with an aching sense of the hopeless sweetness of life. She slipped her hand under her shirt and touched the fresh, inflamed scar under her left breast, felt the slight lump of the explosive that she had had implanted there yesterday, and wondered for the first time if there might be some other way. With a surge of despair, she reflected that only 12 hours ago, she could still have turned back. She and Dylan could still have decided to wait for his parole, to stay the course they had been on for so many years. Closing her hands on swollen palms lacerated by the warped, re-straightened strings of Dylan's first guitar. She knew that by now, the media must be going wild over the discovery of Harris's body, unless the identification was being delayed by the unavailability of a recognizable head. They would have to dig his teeth out of the ground and identify him through his dental records. But they would do that, had no doubt already done it. But it would take them a long time to link the scene to her, since she had never been fingerprinted, not even when the police had taken her from her parents' house to the juvenile detention center. Her swollen and infected palms ached, and her mouth was still filled with a death stench of blood and masticated flesh. How much, boy? Are you hustling? Suck it! Suck it! Again and again she saw his face, the gaping horror of his moment of comprehension. Midnight in the downtown park that he had haunted for decades, where the street boys peddled their asses for drug money. A ravine flanked by woods and the apartment towers beyond them. Well to the side of the graveled central path, a bench almost invisible in the black shadow under a broad bowed tree against the two foot thick trunk. There a figure lay, wrapped in a blanket, pillowed on a knapsack, a battered guitar case, on the ground underneath, bound by its strap to the bench's timbers. Another figure, his figure, appeared on the path, walking slowly from the side street that bordered the park to the south. The glitter and swish of the flask as he took a swig from it. He moved off the path onto the grass, up the mild slope towards the bench, reached it and stood looking down on the sleeper, took another swig, reached down with his left hand and lightly grasped the back of the neck through the blanket. With his right, unzipped his fly, unpacked his flaccid, withered, blotched, circumcised cock. His hoarse, tremulous whisper, how much, boy? Are you hustling? Suck it, suck it. The figure stirred under the blanket. A small hand emerged and cupped the shrunken genitals. The blanket was drawn back from the face, featureless in the black shadow, and the mouth began to suck the withered flesh, 
which responded with the merest hint of tumescence. Behind the television screen glasses, his eyes rolled up and fluttered closed, and his breath grew ragged, until suddenly it stopped short with a sharp, strangled gurgle, followed by a soft, whistling, high-pitched whine. His small eyes were round as coins, staring straight ahead. His mouth had fallen open in a rictus of horror. The shrouded figure at his groin rose and stood face to face with him. Brown hair was spilling from around the beautiful, youthful, blanket-hooded face. Her eyes fixed his in triumphant hate as the mangled, bloody flesh hung from between her grinning teeth and blood dribbled off her chin, and as she spat the masticated white and red remains in his face. He was drawing in a great, shuddering, rasping breath to scream, filling the whole of his lungs like a balloon, when she slipped her right hand under his shirt, found and drew out the knife, and drove it into his windpipe with a precise, close stabbing movement, never taking her eyes off his. He collapsed at her feet, his breath whistling voicelessly through his open throat. She turned, stooped, drew the guitar case from under the bench, took out the terrible scarred guitar, and began swinging it over her head and bringing it down on his face with all the weight of the steel with which it was held together from within. The blanket slipped from her shoulders. Tears flowed down her cheeks and mingled with the blood that dribbled from her now weeping mouth. Again and again, the body of the guitar thudded into his shattered head, driving its remains into the blood-soaked earth as the wood refragmented along the ancient scars, revealing the steel framework beneath, fragments of wood mingling with the mangled blood, brains, and bone. She brought down the guitar again and again until the wood of its body had almost completely rebroken and flaked away from the new steel skeleton, and the neck snapped off in her hands, and the warped strings rebounded and danced crazily as she stopped swinging. She stood looking at the now headless body, with its crushed neck and its pants opened on the gaping bloody wound of its groin, and she wept. They wept together, she and Dylan. Then she leaned against the guitar neck and pressed it into the gore-soaked earth above the body's mangled neck. And this is how the police found it, eight hours later, stuck like a flagstaff amidst the shards of wood, inscribed with the shattered poetry of their years of shared suffering and longing. And the only remaining coherent phrase they could find was carved down the full length of the neck under the burst strings. I don't ever want to see you again. The beautiful, strange countryside flowed past. The stops were few, Gravenhurst, Bracebridge, Huntsville, small towns that were the major centers of the north, with streets empty but for a few little bands of shorts and t-shirt clad teenagers walking back from Max with towering slushies in the blinding sunlight back to hallucinatory first lovemakings, to a soundtrack of summer hits on the local radio, back to the best days of their blissfully predictable lives, the standard legal birthright happiness which she and he had never known, but which they had tried to mimic and adapt to the desperate conditions of their outlawed lives. In North Bay, relatively huge with 50,000 souls, she and five others transferred to another bus to continue north. North of here, the towns were fewer and smaller, the forest shaded from deciduous to evergreen, the terrain became ever more numinously indifferent to the human, with innumerable small cold lakes and roadless hills in which a lost person would not survive three days. An hour out of North Bay, she saw a cow moose standing on the side of the highway, staring, and she felt again the terrible longing for the lost beauty and preciousness of life. The summer long day ended with the sun setting through spectacular violent cloudscapes, flickering with distant lightning. And as total night claimed the road, she descended into a sleep in which he was already there, just below the surface, waiting for her even before she was fully asleep, embracing her from behind, 
where he sat next to her in the aisle seat. She was awakened by the cold white of dawn over the same terrain. There were only two others left on the bus, faceless, in seats somewhere in front of her and behind her. At around 10, the bus turned off the highway, and in the distance, she saw at last the grim, dark, star-shaped castle looming over the incredibly small village that served it. The village showed a by now familiar aspect, deserted houses and streets with uneven, overgrown sidewalks, a small boarded school, a painted white wooden church, also possibly disused, a terrifyingly huge pit bull tied in an unmown square of yard. The bus stopped in front of a minuscule, box-like, pristine, red brick government liquor store, the most alive and current-looking thing in sight, with its open, ouvert sign already glowing red in the dark window. As she dismounted and thanked the impassive, thin, shaven-headed driver, an undernourished-looking teenage couple, sitting on the worn bench beside the entrance, looked at her curiously. This striking, tall, beautiful woman in urban jacket, blue jeans, and sunglasses, evidently from the South, so jarringly incongruous here. The girl murmured something to the boy, and Melinda caught only the latter end of it. That woman in the car this morning. She smiled weakly at them. They smiled and said hi, and she proceeded to walk down the unpeopled main street in the direction of the castle, making sure to look like she knew where she was going. The tottering, grass-fringed, winter-worn panels of the sidewalk led her past a grim, shadowy diner on the smallest value mart she had ever seen, both of them closed. Then the houses began small one- and two-story houses, many of them with the original wood siding and glass windows, houses faded and battered by decades of savage winters, like the roiling, frost-tormented footpaths that led to them through front yards mown and empty, or cluttered with vehicles, barbecues, lawn furniture, and fading junk. In front of one house, a man was walking from the wooden steps towards a gigantic all-terrain vehicle with wheels as tall as a human being. He looked at her, paused a moment, then smiled and said, morning, to which she responded with a nod and a weak smile. Reaching the intersecting street where the departing bus had turned right, she turned left and saw the prison looming at the end like some monstrous brooding octopus-like parasite that watched her through its wire-topped walls and towers as she approached. Reaching the street that ran between the town and the prison, which overshadowed the houses on the opposite side like a mile-long cliff, she stopped to remember the satellite map she had found on the internet, oriented herself, and looked to the right, where she knew she would see the portcullis of the entrance two streets away. She felt under her left breast with her right hand, touched the lump, she looked at her watch, quarter to 11. She had to announce herself at 11 to begin the long process, exactly how long she did not know, of being half ingested into the institution's stone and steel guts, half translated for her brief, touchless encounter with one of the souls on the other side. She crossed the empty street to the ancient crumbling weed-fringed sidewalk under the ancient black stone wall and set off. She felt her heart pounding, booming in the infinite total silence as she saw the central tower of the entrance looming larger and larger. Her intellect and attention were lucid, but beyond she felt the tremendous pressure of the mood of tragedy and regret that had been welling up throughout the journey north. She began to fear that they would see barely suppressed terror and madness in her face when she arrived at the gate. Yet at the same time, she felt that the part of her that was carrying out this role was somehow independent and unthreatened by the collapse she feared. Just before the massive arched portcullis, she looked at her watch, 10.50. The two-block journey along the wall, which had felt timelessly long, had taken only five minutes. She looked to the right across the street and saw a car parked 
on one side of the intersecting street that ran perpendicularly up to the gate like a monumental avenue. Hey! A woman's voice, shouting, angry, challenging, to the right of her and behind her, maybe 20 paces distant. She turned and saw a woman walking rapidly and determinedly along the opposite sidewalk, staring at her, wide-eyed with fury and indignation. She wore pants and a long, light brown coat belted at the waist. She must have been in her 50s, with mid-length, curly black hair, olive complexion, Jewishly beautiful. She needlessly looked back for traffic as she stepped off the sidewalk and began crossing the street towards Melinda. Who are you? The woman said, loudly, but no longer shouting, at two-thirds of the way across the street. Melinda couldn't measure the rage in her face, couldn't predict whether the imminent violence would be physical or merely verbal. Panic flooded her mind, washing out her fragile plan, her sense of time, reducing her to unthinking animal impulsiveness. She turned and ran along the sidewalk that continued on the other side of the portcullis, towards the next crag-like wing where she knew the visiting section was. Her heart was pounding again. This was certainly Lilith Levitt. She didn't know why she was here now, but this was certainly her. She must have somehow found out that Melinda would be coming to the prison at this time. It couldn't possibly be a coincidence. But how could she have found out? Dylan would never have told her, not voluntarily at least. But maybe he'd slipped up somehow. Maybe she'd somehow forced or tricked it out of him. As she ran, a cold abyss of vertiginous horror opened in her. Could the police have possibly linked her already to Harris's killing, which must be all over the news this morning? Could Dund have already contacted the police with the knowledge of her identity that he had been planning to blackmail her with, as Julia had told her two nights ago during the phone call in which they were reconciled? Maybe they were ready for her in the prison, ready to arrest her. But by now it didn't matter. She knew the prison's layout. Dylan had told her she didn't really need to get in. By now, he would have been brought to the visiting section. Or maybe not, if they knew. She couldn't think. She was breathing hard as she ran, on the verge of beginning to moan like a hunted animal. The black wall fell away on her left as she reached the first yawning gulf between the mammoth wings of the prison's star-like structure. The next wing was further back from the street, ahead and to the left of her, across an institutional lawn of feeble grass. She turned off the sidewalk and onto the lawn. Hey, she heard again behind her, not far back, only a few paces behind. Levitt was running after her. How dangerous was she? Was she going to kill her? Was she mad too? But the madness Melinda shared with Dylan, the madness of their secret dream world, that madness was theirs alone. It was. She reached the black rock wall and turned, stood with legs and arms apart, breathing raggedly at bay. Levitt was still running, ten seconds behind her. She stopped almost within reach of her, breathing heavily. Melinda read rage in her face, but mingled with it, instead of insanity, she saw perplexity, innocent confusion, a pleading for enlightenment. So Levitt didn't know. She didn't understand what was happening. Melinda had to feel sorry for her. They were sisters, women in love with the same man, but this Lilith was the fucked over one, the used one. It wasn't right, but nothing was right. Fate had fucked them all over, and they were all going to die. Listen, said Levitt in a low voice, breathing heavily, recovering her breath, putting out a conciliatory, calming hand. You're Christina Casimiro, aren't you? Again, Melinda felt the gulf of fear yawn within her, but looking into Levitt's face and seeing the compassion of pride mingled with the anger and fear, she understood again that Levitt didn't know. Listen, he's forgotten you, Levitt said between breaths. You've got to understand that those days have been over for him for 25 years. Melinda backed up towards the wall and didn't speak. Her expression, staring with innocent animal fear, must have conformed exactly to what Levitt expected of her. She could see that Levitt pitied her. She actually pitied her, thinking that she was some aging, simple-minded groupie 
whose adolescent fling with a rock star had haunted and defined the whole of her failed and empty life, and who in the sudden desolation of middle age was now succumbing to the obsession which had furnished the only meaning she had ever known. Obviously, Dylan had told Levitt very little, just enough to serve as a foundation for Levitt's self-serving fantasy in which she was his life's central event, self-serving for both of them, because yes, Dylan had deceived and used her. He had acknowledged as much to Melinda. But how much evil had there been in that for any of them, in these incredibly terrible and sad circumstances in which all of them were so imprisoned and lonely? Christina, Melinda flinched inwardly at this jarringly false name, which she had never heard from anyone but her parents. Dylan and I have a life together. We've been together for 15 years and will be together when he gets out of here in five years. We share an art. We share a sensibility and passions that we both live for. Christina, we're married. We got married right here five years ago. We're legally husband and wife. What you had with him all those years ago, that was beautiful and it was tragic. But Christina, it's over. I know about your tragedy. I know you've suffered and that you must be suffering now. But you can't go back. None of us can. Those days are over. Levitt was looking at her with the utmost seriousness and urgency as she spoke. She had mastered her breath and was speaking without pauses, but it wasn't false, even though she had obviously thought long about what she would say. She was speaking to her as to an equal, woman to woman. Melinda felt she couldn't believe her. She could believe her. But could it be true that they were married? It couldn't be. Dylan had never told her this, and he would have told her. There would have been no reason for him not to, because the reasons for his relationship with Levitt were all very obvious and practical, and even marriage would simply have made sense. But even if he had done this, married her, and just not told Melinda because he was afraid it would hurt and confuse her, like he had not wanted to tell Levitt that Melinda had taken her visiting time, even if he had done this, Melinda knew that it was Levitt who was deluded, and not her. Levitt shared no dream world with Dylan. She couldn't. She didn't have that gift, a gift which for all Dylan and Melinda themselves knew was shared by themselves alone. And the literary life Levitt did share with him was a shallow substitute for such a world, merely intellectual, unrooted in the pre-rational profundity of childhood. Whatever Lilith Levitt, this intelligent, strong, sincere, and good woman whom Melinda had always respected and now loved, whatever Lilith knew about the past and the present of all three of them, she didn't, couldn't know about the mountain by the sea, the cottage in the forest, the chairs where they sat and sang and wrote songs together, the beach where they made love. She could not go there to their secret dream world, which had its roots in the deepest self-sharing of starved psychological twins with no other refuge in the world besides each other. She was not one of them. She belonged in the common world of shared daylight, and it was only by a cruel jest of fate that she had fallen in love with a man of a nature that she could never know. And the punchline of this jest was that she would be sucked into the firestorm which would liberate them and annihilate her. Melinda stood backed against the wall, legs and arms slightly spread, her face reflecting an unalarmed caution. She felt under her left breast again. Dylan must be there by now, just behind this five feet thick of massive rock. And suddenly she could feel him, but faintly. He was distressed, urgent, pleading with her from what felt like a distance. He must be able to feel the threat. The time was passing. She should have been inside by now, should perhaps already be sitting opposite him in front of the glass that would divide them according to the scene of the visiting hall that he had painted for her. She could feel that he was shouting to her across this unaccountable chasm, shouting things that she knew, that she had to hurry, the time was short, they were in danger, he loved her. Lilith stood before her, staring urgently and earnestly into her face, with no idea that she was about to die along with the lovers, with whose destiny her own had haplessly become tangled. Melinda ceased to fear. This was Lilith's destiny too. 
There could be no writer moment for her to enter death's dream of oblivion, though for her the dream would be a lonely one. She raised her hand again and squeezed the lump beneath her breast. <laughs>